state laws. Um, of course, the state laws vary by state. Um, some states are very strict, other states are very, very lax and have almost no laws. Um, but the federal laws are the main ones here. Um, and basically what they do is they, they mandate that any projects that disturb the earth that are on either on federal land or regulated by or receive funding from the federal government have to meet certain cultural resource requirements. So usually um, that involves basically satisfying uh, Showing, satisfying the government that you have, are not that your project is not going to damage or impact cultural resources, and cultural resources are pretty widely defined. Um, they usually mean things like archaeological sites, historic sites, cemeteries, um, but even as far as like um, interesting local architecture or um, examples of. For instance, the, the first log cabin west of the Mississippi River, that would be something that would be considered a cultural resource. Um, so that triggers a process. Um, the first step of the process is usually a survey. Well, we call it a phase one survey. Uh, these surveys investigate the area of potential effect, or APE, of a project. Uh, so that may be anything from the footprint of a building that's proposed to a pipeline corridor that's you know, 600 miles long. Uh, and it, usually the, the phase one is a presence or absence survey. So we go out in the field and we do a bunch of different techniques to see if there's anything there. Um, so we do pedestrian survey. This is a picture of a crew of mine in Michigan getting ready to survey a pipeline corridor through a cornfield. Um, you may notice we all have things wrapped around our faces because Corn is very sharp and pretty unpleasant to walk through. Um, but in, for that, that's called a pedestrian survey. So we just line up, usually 50 feet apart or so, and walk in a straight line looking at the ground. Uh, you find a surprising amount of archaeological materials that way. Uh, but sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you have to actually dig little holes, um, shovel tests, when you can't see what's on the ground in front of you. And then we also, nowadays, we're starting to use more and more um, geophysical methods or remote sensing methods. So this is my friend um, back in Michigan. He's using a uh, uh, magnetometer. So this is just a little device that measures the magnetism of the soil. So when, if there was a fire in a place that, that heated the soil to very high temperatures, it often changes the magnetism of that soil. So we just look for anomalies with this and um, then usually dig a hole where we find an anomaly and it's remarkable how accurate these little things are. Um, we also do a lot of remote sensing nowadays, which is where you use satellite imagery or even just like Google Earth. Um, you can often see building footprints and strange patterns in the landscape that when you go out and investigate, it helps you fine tune where you're going to be looking. Uh, so we really just identify any resources that will be impacted. And usually, we consider that to be anything 50 years or older. So you spend a lot of time recording beer cans from the 1970s. <laughs> and so at this point, you just, record, you just identify and record. Um, and the next step is usually what we call a phase two. Uh, so a phase two is where we evaluate the things that have been found in the phase one. Sometimes we do these, th these two together. You'll, if you find something, you go right away and do a little phase two on it. So phase two is usually involve these small scale excavations. And you're testing to evaluate the resource to see Basically, is it eligible for the National Register? And that's actually a fairly complicated question. There's lists of criteria. I'm not going to get into all of that. But if it is eligible, then that means it has to be protected or mitigated in some way. The impacts to it have to be mitigated. Um, so the phase two is pretty much what is, what is it that we've found. Um, and then the phase three is actually the least common. I've, only worked on about half a dozen of these in five years, as opposed to close to 100 phase one projects. Um, so phase three is if, if you've discovered a resource that is eligible, then a lot of times they'll just avoid it. They'll just reroute the project around it or figure out some way to, to carry out the project without impacting the resource. But sometimes you can't do that. 
And so then what will happen is a data recovery excavation. And this is a little bit more like archaeology that you see on TV where you have big open excavations and people sitting with brushes and um, excavating. So this is actually a site that I worked on in Detroit uh, a couple of years ago. It was a, the site of a 19th century hotel by the Detroit River. Really very fascinating site. We got a lot of cool stuff out of it. Um, and then the final major part of CRM is monitoring. Um, this is something that happens at the construction end when, when a project is already ongoing. Um, you really, you just observe all the earth, work, earth moving activities. So um, you basically watch them dig trenches or watch them bulldoze and you look for bricks in the ground or for strange stains in the soil. Um, it's a lot of boring work. You sit in the car a lot of times. You, uh, you know, if you've ever been on a construction site, you realize that um, because of the way different tasks have to, the order the different tasks have to happen, everybody spends a lot of time sitting around waiting for someone else to get their job done. Uh, so this is actually, all these pictures are actually from a, uh, a large project I was on in Arkansas. Um, this is actually taken from the top of the Mississippi River levee. So the Mississippi River is like right here. And I sat there for three weeks and watched them dig a small hole and flood it. It flooded every day. And they, they dig it the next day and it would flood and dig it and it would flood. Um, took three weeks to install one little tiny um, piece of a pipeline. Uh, okay, so there's, obviously this requires a lot of manpower or human power. And uh, that's where anthropologists come in. Um, so there's a bunch of different types of jobs. At the entry level, there's really two, two main jobs at the entry level. There's the field tech and the lab tech. And as you would guess, they work in the field and in the lab. Um, these, a lot of the entry level jobs um, don't require much of a background. I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but when, after you've done this for a little while, when you get to the mid-level, there's a bunch more, you know, there's many more options that open up. Um, GPS technicians are kind of the backbone of much of what we do. Um, that's often the first thing you move to after being a field tech. You just walk around with a GPS unit, you're responsible for recording everything that happens in the field, for um, surveying in the edges of your, your sites and where artifacts are found. Um, you often end up producing maps at that level. Um, and then a crew chief or field director, these terms are a little variable. Um, sometimes field directors are much more senior people. They're it's kind of like the person who runs the whole project. But some companies, a field director is just a crew chief. Uh, that's the person who tells people where to dig and you, know, you do a lot of logistics work. Um, lab specialists are obviously people who have you know, gained a specialty in some sort of material culture or scientific analysis, there's you know, people who specialize in dating methods or um, uh, doing protein analysis and all sorts of fancy stuff. Um, and then the project archaeologist. Uh, project archaeologist is basically a project director, project manager. They do a lot of things like they, they a lot of times they're the ones who will hire techs. They figure out where you're going to stay. They figure out what rental vehicles you're going to get. They um, usually work about 90 hours a week. <laughs> and, um, they're the people who get phone calls, you know, every five minutes with absolutely pressing emergencies. Um, and that's also tied in with the logistics. Um, usually a project archaeologist is also deals with the archaeological stuff. Um, whereas a logistics person is really more focused on hotels and flights and rental cars and um, all that stuff. And then at the senior level uh, is the principal investigator. This is a person who's responsible for writing reports, for um, writing proposals for, for projects, uh, things like that. The principal investigator usually is someone who either has 20 years plus experience or has a PhD and you know, 10 years experience. Um, most principal investigators have a PhD. So that's kind of the top level in CRM. Uh, so the types of employment, uh, most of the jobs in this field are temporary, seasonal, or project to project. Um, this usually means a lot of time, a lot of these, the firms that do cultural resource management are, are very small. 
and they only have a handful of permanent staff, usually a couple project archaeologists and a PI. And when they get a contract and they have to send crews out into the field, they hire temporary people. You're just hired for this one project uh, or for one summer if they have a bunch of projects. And you work for the company until it's over and then everybody gets laid off. And uh, so some years I've been laid off, you know, 30 or 40 times, but you go into it knowing that that's going to happen. You're here for jobs that last anywhere from one day to years. Um, the fixed term jobs are more common for federal government. Uh, so the National Park Service, National Forest Service, um, a couple other government agencies, they hire large groups of techs just for a summer. Um, that's a great, those are great jobs for getting a lot of experience in one area. Um, you tend to work in one national park. You tend to do everything within that park. Um, they usually give you some sort of housing there and you, you just, you, you get to know that little slice of the world very, very, very well. Um, and then at the end you get laid off. <laughs> and then there's the permanent jobs. These are actually fairly rare at the entry level. Um, I know a couple of companies that do try to hire permanent techs even just out of college, but most of you have to have a couple years of experience at, on the temporary side. Um, what we call, it, there's a term that I'm not really a fan of, uh, shovel bum. That's what they call people who, kind of itinerant archaeologists who go from project to project. Um, so you usually have to do that for a couple of years before you can get to a permanent position, but sometimes you're not. So, okay, so who hires archaeologists? So most of the companies I've actually worked for are cultural resource management firms. That's all they do. Um, sometimes they do architectural history and archaeology. Um, sometimes they'll have ethnographers or uh, other anthropologists on staff. Um, but they don't do engineering. They don't do anything else. They just do this regulatory cultural resources side. So these are some of the big companies. Um, Search is based in Florida. They work all over the country, though. I worked for them for about a year. They're actually one of the better companies. Um, Swicka is a big company. Southwest Cultural Associates. Um, there's a whole bunch of these. They, they range, most of them are very small companies, kind of like little mom and pops. They usually will have a PI and one or two project archeologists and at any time employ anywhere from zero to hundreds of technicians on a temporary basis. Um, Search is one of the companies that hires, they try to hire everybody permanent. Uh, okay, so then some of the big engineering and surveying firms also have a small cultural resources group. So some of the big firms in this are Tetra Tech, Anderson Perry, they're a surveying firm in Eastern Oregon, um, AECOM, there's a bunch of other ones. You will often see people from these companies working on the side of the highway. Um, and sometimes you'll even see archeologists. Uh, and then federal and state governments hire a lot of archaeologists. Most of the federal government jobs are slightly higher level. They, they require some experience, um, but they do hire, you know, the, as I said earlier, the National Parks and National Forest Service will hire groups of techs for a summer. Um, state government is pretty much the same. And then also tribal governments. Some tribes hire uh, quite a few archaeologists. Um, some tribes only have one archaeologist on staff, but you know, I just saw an ad from uh, the Burns Paiute tribe is looking for like five or six uh, entry level technicians for this summer. Uh, and our clients. So I'd say probably 80% of the work in the field is actually the energy industry. Uh, so anything like um, pressurized gas pipelines or power lines, they're regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So anything they do has to be, has to satisfy these federal laws. Uh, so pipeline projects usually, a, a large pipeline will employ two to 300 archeologists sometimes for, for two or three years at a time. Um, this leads to some issues because a lot of people who work in this field start to get the idea that we work for these industries. Um, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. We don't work for these industries, we regulate them. We're not here to say, yes, you can build a pipeline. We're not here to support a pipeline or to oppose it. We're here to 
ensure that there are no that there's not damage to the cultural resources. Um, so we, we don't work for them, we regulate them. It's a very important concept that often gets missed. Um, transportation projects and communications projects are very similar. Um, development projects, usually these are housing and urban development block grants uh, that are given out usually in um, parts of like revitalization projects within cities. So I've done a lot of work in, in Detroit, uh, some work in Toledo, uh, a lot of Rust Belt cities, they, they get a lot of money from housing and urban development. And so anytime they dig a hole, they have to have a uh, archeologist come out, look at it. Uh, and then of course, federal government and state and local government. Okay, so I'll put everything up on the screen. <laughs> so the required qualifications for most of the entry level positions are very simple. Um, Usually a four-year degree in anthropology, archaeology, or a related subject. That's not, that's sometimes flexible. Um, I've worked with some people who have, you know, three and a half years but never actually graduated. And, you know, if they meet all the other requirements, they can end up working in the field. I actually have my undergraduate degree is in ancient Near Eastern studies, which is related, but not really. <laughs> So, so these are all slightly flexible. Um, you usually need a field school, and then a lot of jobs nowadays, especially in the energy industry and the federal government jobs, require um, background checks and drug tests. Um, that's problematic on its own, uh, especially the background checks, but um, that is a, a that if, if you can't pass that, that really does limit your, um, the types of jobs you can apply for. Um, and then in the helpful skills. These are all things, a lot of these you gain in the field, but um, the archeological specialties are huge. Uh, every company needs someone who can look at a bunch of broken flakes and write a report on it, or analyze ceramics, or analyze bones. And one of the things that happens in, a, in CRM is you're, you have to record everything that's over 50 years. So you might be recording a Paleo-Indian site right next to a, you know, farm site from the 1920s. And so you have to be able to handle that wide range of material culture. And so CRM firms need people with every kind of background. Um, GIS, GPS, and surveying, making the maps, that's the, the majority of every report is maps. And there are not enough people who are good at this. Uh, I've seen a lot of really terrible maps. Um, so that's actually a great skill. That's a skill you can get in, when you're an undergraduate, you can you know, take classes in GIS, you can learn how to make maps. Um, it's, it's a really important skill. Technical drawing and photography, of course. Um, and it's using a compass and a map. I guarantee that you will spend time, if you do CRM, you will spend time working in areas where you are at least two hour drive from the nearest cell phone signal. So your maps on your phone will not work. You might have a Garmin that has preloaded maps guarantee you the roads on it have not been updated since the 1990s, you will end up in trouble. Um, knowing how to read a map, both a road map and like a to uh, topography map out in the wilderness, being able to navigate with nothing but a compass and a map uh, is a huge skill. Um, it's hard to get that skill nowadays because there's not many opportunities to practice these things. Um, and then hiking survival first aid, you know, you you're gonna spend a lot of time outside knowing what to do when you see a snake, uh, knowing what to do if you fall off a cliff and break your leg. Uh, these are all very important skills. And then technical writing is the most important skill. Uh, every report needs to be written. <laughs> and, uh, people, people who struggle with technical writing struggle in this field, but you can get better at it no matter what your skills are. You can improve your technical writing. The most important thing is to just practice and write a lot, write whenever you can. And most companies, if they realize you know how to write, they will never let you go. <laughs> okay, so how do you actually get a job? This is, so this, it's a, CRM is a fairly small world. Um, the, your first job is always the hardest to get because no one knows you yet. 
Um, so there are some job sites. I, I have them at the end of this presentation. Um, and there are job ads that go up there every day. Those are not the best way to get a job unless you're just starting out because most companies, they have a list of techs that they've worked with before, people who they know and who you know, they know you can do the work. And so when they get a project, they, call, they start calling their tech list. So almost all the jobs I've gotten, I've gotten because somebody calls me and is like, hey, are you available next week? We have a job in Idaho. In Idaho. And then you know, that happens. But when you're, if you're not on anybody's tech list, you have to get the job by sending your resume to people. Um, so the networking is really important. Uh, getting to know your local community of archaeologists is crucial. Um, so something like the Association of Oregon Archaeologists is a cool place. Um, I'm sure there's, there's a lot of other communities getting to know the archaeologists here on campus. Um, and going to conferences, going to talks, um, doing research, uh, all of that is really great. And that will help you get a job. Okay, so, of course with this job you spend a lot of time on the road. Um, the last five years I think I averaged between 250 and 300 days a year sleeping in a bed that was not mine. Um, this is a very small selection of them. Um, this job was cool because I actually got to bring my little dog with me. She stayed because I was close enough to home. I was in Ohio. I lived in Detroit. Um, so that was a lot of fun. But most of the time you just stay in little hotel rooms in whatever town you happen to be working. Um, sometimes you end up in slightly different situations. Um, I lived in this, uh, this little Kia for almost three months. <laughs> I, every, especially out in the West, there's a lot of jobs in, you know, that's much more sparsely populated than the Eastern part of the United States. So there's a lot of jobs that are much more remote. Um, a lot of jobs where you end up camping. Uh, this was actually in Utah, I think. Um, I spent six months straight living in a tent in Arkansas over the winter a couple of years ago. That was rough. <laughs> it rained every single day. Um, but sometimes you get really lucky. This uh, was with my crew on a job in Maine earlier this summer. There were no hotels in the region at all. It was a very remote area, but it turned out there was a really nice luxury uh, lakeside resort. So we all had our own cabin with like a barbecue grill on each porch and this wonderful lake. Um, that doesn't happen often. <laughs> so is it right for you? This is, so there are a lot of people who join, who enter this field and then realize it's not for them and leave very quickly. I think something like 50% of CRM archeologists don't ever take a second job. They, they do their first job, they get laid off and they say, this is not for me. So there are a lot of pros and cons. Um, the biggest one for me is you get to see the country. And this is just a very small sec selection of landscape photos that I've taken. And none of these were planned photos. These are just like I'm walking along and I'm like, click. Uh, you, I've seen some of the coolest parts of the country and parts of the country that you don't usually get to see because they're, you know, a three, four hour hike from the nearest road. A lot of times on land that you don't have access to usually. Um, that's great. You get to build your technical skills. I've learned a lot of things doing CRM archaeology that now really help me in doing academic archaeology. Skills like GIS, GPS, um, just knowing what, it is, what I see on the ground. Um, you get to network with the archaeological community. I've met hundreds of archaeologists. My Facebook, I probably have three or four hundred archaeologists as friends on Facebook. Um, so that actually is huge because now I know what's going on all over the world in archaeology. I know what's going on all over the country. I know where jobs are. I know what is happening at all the different projects. And that's huge. And also there's a lot of informal learning that happens on these projects. You have a bunch of people who love archaeology. You're staying in a hotel in the middle of nowhere. You spend a lot of time sitting in the parking lot of the hotel flint napping or talking about archaeology or arguing about archaeology. Um, it's really fun. And you also, as I said earlier, you work with everything from stuff that's 50 years old to stuff that's, you know, 20,000 years old. Uh, 
Oh wait, more pictures. <laughs> this is actually in Detroit. Um, this was the closest I ever worked to home. This was about a seven minute drive from my house. It is pretty cool. Uh, okay, so the cons. Uh, you get to see the country. <laughs> you, spend, you will spend a lot of time in parts of the country that are, people don't vacation there. Um, you spend a lot of time in very rural places, very remote places, places that don't have all the things you might be used to like cell phone service and multiple stores where you can buy the same item. Um, you often have one choice of where to buy anything and that's usually Walmart. Uh, you spend a lot of time away from home, which for some people that's another attraction of the job. Um, it gets significantly harder if you have a family or if you have home responsibilities. Um, you spend a lot of time away from home. It puts a lot of strain on relationships and um, makes it very difficult to do things like have dogs. Uh, you get the snakes, swamps, and spiders. Uh, I have a like, pathological fear of spiders. I hate spiders. I get sick when I see them. Um, they're everywhere. <laughs> you will deal with them. You will deal with snakes. Uh, you will walk through a lot of swamps. You will walk through briar patches. You will walk through things where, places where everything wants to kill you. And it's 120 degrees out. And it's, you know, yeah, there's a lot of difficult field conditions. Um, sometimes that actually becomes part of the fun of it, though. If you have a good crew of people, you all are pulling together, you're all suffering through it, you're all working for this, this goal, which is you know, protecting and preserving the cultural heritage of the country. And when you get on a crew like that, the worst conditions in the country are, are worth it. Um, and then there's a lot of boring archaeology. There's a lot of negative. You, there's a lot of, you walk out into a swamp and you say, yes, it's still a swamp, and you take a picture and you walk back to your car. You spend, you can spend, in some parts of the country, you can spend months working and not see any artifacts. Um, that's really common in, in places where, like in the Great Lakes states, where you have to dig holes, you don't see stuff on the surface as much. In the desert, you see archaeology everywhere, but if you're, if, you're digging, if you're working in a place where you have to dig shovel tests, you can go long periods of time without anything fun. Um, and then the companies and the pay rates vary widely. Um, the southeast part of the country has some really, really cool archaeology, but really harsh conditions, really low pay, you know, 11 to 12 dollars an hour is normal. Um, yeah, that's with a degree and years of experience. Uh, other companies pay much better. Um, and as you get into the field, you start to learn which companies to work for and which ones don't. Um, there's also a, a wide range of ethics that you'll run into. You'll run into companies who um, see their role as, as finding a way to justify this project happening rather than actually protecting the resources. Uh, and if you're someone who cares about the ethics, that can be very difficult and so you don't work for those companies. Uh, oh yeah, and then there's a high level of temporary and project to project employment. And also, there's, so there's a lot of precarity in this field. Um, a lot of projects, you don't really know how long the projects are going to last. Um, I've flown halfway across the country to projects that were supposed to last months, get there, work for three days, and the project gets canceled. Um, that happens. Uh, you also will go to a job that they tell you is going to last three days and you're there for months. Uh, so it, there's also a lot of boom and bust cycles. So even on, on a like month to month basis, so you can go, you know, a month where everyone you know is unemployed, no one's finding jobs, and then all of a sudden everybody gets work at once. Uh, so that, that adds to a lot of stress. It makes, you know, it makes it difficult to budget and do things because you never know if you're going to be making thousands of dollars this month or none. Um, so that's a, another con. Um, so here's some resources. These are the three main job sites, um, archaeology field work and shovelbums.org. Uh, the guy who runs shovelbums.org is, his name is R. Joe Brandon. He's on Facebook and Twitter. He's, uh, he's kind of a giant in the community. He does a lot of work for he does a lot of research on the field, so he does a lot of things, you know, surveying workers to see how much people are making, where, what conditions are in different parts of the country. Um, he recently just finished a very long project 
that I think he started back in 2005 that was examining uh, sexual harassment in the field, which um, I didn't mention it in the slides, but that is, you know, as with many field work based industries, it's something that we are struggling with and we're uh, getting better at, but there are still issues. Uh, but actually, shovelbumps.org is a great resource for a lot of things. Um, USAjobs.gov is where all the national forest, national parks jobs are. Um, and then there's this uh, list on the Oregon government uh, state historic preservation website of all of the uh, licensed archaeological contractors that are licensed to work in the state of Oregon. So there's a lot of them. Um, but one way to start getting a job is to just look at that list and just start sending companies your resume and a cover letter explaining who you are and telling them you want to break into this field. Uh, so that's all I have. Um, I don't know if we have any time for questions, but... Uh, we do not. We do not. Okay. <laughs> but I'll be hanging out here for a few minutes anyway, so if you have any questions, feel free to come up and chat with me.